Well, hey, Eastview family, so grateful to be with you. My name is Tommy Politz, and I'm always excited to have the privilege to get a chance to open up the Word of God and to teach the Scriptures because my deepest desire in my heart is, is that God would break me open, uh, break me in order to remake me, to teach me something that really leaves me changed a uh, different man than the moment that I get up here, than the moment that I even share what it is uh, that God's laid on my heart. So it's wonderful to be with you again. Uh, I pray for you regularly. I do uh, love you uh, deeply, and I'm excited about sharing with you today. I wasn't supposed to be here. Somebody else was scheduled to be here, and um, so that person ended up, well, they, they ended up having to cancel, and so I guess it was Tuesday or Wednesday, Tyler, we talked, and so it was like, uh, what are we going to do? I'm like, well, I guess I'm coming. So I was preparing a different sermon for my church back in Texas, and then I had to shift gears. I'm like, where are we in John? And I just want you to know that this, I've not preached this message before. This is a brand new message. Some of the concepts, yes, but this is a brand new message that God's laid on my heart, and my prayer, my deepest prayer for all of you, whether you are watching online or later this week you're on demand or whatever it may be, my deepest prayer and hope is that literally that we would humble ourselves, strip uh, the facade, the pride, the mask that we might have, and really see what Jesus has to say to us through this powerful text in John chapter 13. So I'm just going to say a quick prayer, and then let's buckle up, all right? Heavenly Father, do what only you can do through your word. Do it in me, the messenger. Do it in us, the family of God at Eastview. Do it, Lord, in the people, the elders here at Eastview, in the staff. Lord, I pray for the servants of this church. that you do something so significant in and through them that unless they are in tune with you, whatever they put their hand to would be doomed for failure, Lord. But not with you, Lord, all things are possible. So may your word, which we know does not move without purpose, may your word find rich, fertile soil in each of our hearts May you break us in order to remake us. May you teach us something new and fresh. May we come alive today. Your word, Lord, you, Jesus, have told us that man does not live on bread alone, but on the very word of God. Let us live today. Let us be alive today through your teaching and instruction. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, go to John chapter 13 is where we are in our study on John. John chapter 13. Now, the book of John is a single book, but a lot of scholars have said it's actually two books. In the first 12 chapters of the book of Signs, chapters then 13 through 21, is the book of glory. So if you really want to look at it, you can say it's the book of Signs and then the book of glory. The first 12 chapters, we're seeing miracle after miracle and then discourse of Jesus. Jesus performs miracles, wonders, and signs, and then different than some of the other gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke called the synoptic gospels, what we see is discourse or explanation so that there's spiritual application. And it's really an amazing thing that the Lord does. That's the first 12 chapters. Then there is a major shift as we move from chapter 12, Jesus predicting his death as last week, Mark Moore is J.K. Jones and Mark Moore uh, teaching the last couple of weeks, leading us to this place and, and showing the, the discourse of Jesus saying, okay, my death is coming. There's an impending death. And over and over in the gospels, it says the disciples didn't get it. The disciples just didn't understand for some reason what it was that Jesus was saying and what he intended and what he meant by this. Then you make this massive shift and you get to chapter 13 and the rest of the gospel is about one sign and a long discourse about that one sign, the ultimate miracle wonder and sign that is to come, the sign of the cross. 
And if we don't have a rich, robust understanding of the cross, uh, of the theology of atonement, of what Jesus is saying, what the whole purpose in all of this is. So I do think that for centuries, as people say, this is really now the book of glory because it is the glory of the Lord that is the cross, even though sometimes it seems like we say, well, really, that's how Jesus saw it, that is. So we pick up in John chapter 13, if you have your Bibles uh, or maybe an electronic device, you can turn, tap, or click to John chapter 13, and I wanna start in verse one, and here's what it says. It was just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew the time had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. So he's already said, it's, it's time for me to go. I, I've, done my pur- I'm, I've fulfilled my purposes in my earthly ministry. Now the climax, right? And then having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. He now loves them to the very end. Now this is fascinating because... When we look at verse one, this is the beginning where the next five chapters, really five and a half chapters in the Bible all take place in one night. People don't realize that some, John chapter 13, John chapter 14, John chapter 15, 16, 17, and half of 18 all takes place on Thursday, and specifically Thursday evening, the day before Jesus Christ is going to be crucified. Chapter 12, he's already been predicting his death. So you have 21 chapters. John walks with Jesus for approximately three years. He's an inner circle friend, right? Peter, James, and John. John, the author, again, of not only this gospel, but of five letters or books in the New Testament. Out of the 27 books, he penned five of them. John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John in the book of Revelation. He says that the time had now come and Jesus was ready for his departure and he knew it. And what we get in John chapter 13, right up to halfway through 18 for five and a half chapters is Jesus having a last meal with his disciples and then giving a farewell sermon and then a farewell prayer right before he gets arrested. That's what these chapters are. And it all takes place in, I believe, in a room, what we call the upper room. And there is a unique thing that happens that kicks this whole moment off that we read about in the 13th chapter. So verse two says that the evening meal was being served and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, right? Had already prompted Judas Iscariot. So the evening meal's in progress. And the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. So he already knew what was about to happen with Judas. Now, I I think it's easy for us to think Judas was so horrible, so wretched, But you have to remember, uh, really, that Jesus called Judas out just like he did everyone. What a great mystery that is. Jesus poured into him the same way that he did the other disciples. I often wonder, how did Judas, Judas get where he was? He was a part of the best small group in the history of the world, led by the greatest small group facilitator in the history of the world, and he still never had the word of God sink deeply into his heart like it should have. I don't know the reasons for it. There's so much mystery. That's a whole other sermon for another day that we don't have time to get into because Tyler gave me a definite time limit here today. Thank you, Tyler. I love you. So we will continue to move on. Another sermon for another day if you'll have me back. All right. So Jesus gets up from the meal, takes his outer clothing and off his cloak, right? And he wraps a towel around his waist. Immediately, the disciples have to be thinking to themselves, what in the world is he doing? And you see that later out of Peter's response. He's shocked. Verse five, after that, he poured water into a basin. and He began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel that had been wrapped around him. There is an old ancient Jewish literature piece where there's a husband named Joseph and he has his wife uh, and Anetha and she comes 
to offer to wash his feet. And in this ancient literature, he says, absolutely not. And the reason that he says, you will not wash my feet is because that was considered to be the lowliest of service to anyone. You just, I mean, you don't wash somebody's feet. In fact, in ancient Jewish culture, rabbis taught that Jewish people were not even to wash each other's feet. A Gentile could wash your feet. Even, it was so deeply entrenched, if you were Jewish and a Jew had a Jewish servant or slave, that, and again, a whole different message for another day about how they, that their whole servanthood and indentured servant and, and slavery worked in their day, but you would not allow a Jewish slave, it was beneath a Jewish slave to wash another Jewish person's feet. But a Gentile, right, those dogs, they could come and wash our feet. So this was the way that this was seen. So you can imagine that the Jewish carpenter from Nazareth, their rabbi, their Lord, is here in this context, in ancient Near Eastern Judaism in this culture, the Greco-Roman world even understood this. In the Greco-Roman world, there is not a single incident that we have anybody of a lower stature, stature washing the feet in the Greco-Roman Judeo-Christian first century New Testament. There's no, no amount of research that has ever exposed that someone from higher position would then stoop themselves down to actually wash the feet of someone of a lower position. It's unthinkable. It's inconscionable. You just, you just don't do this. So it says, he came to Simon Peter, verse six. Simon Peter says to him, Lord, Lord are you gonna wash my feet? You know what he's saying here. Don't do this. Don't wash my feet. Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you're gonna understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Remind you of something else in the gospels where Jesus also was told by Peter. Peter said, no, 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 you shall never die on a cross. Peter wanted a crown without a cross. That's what he wanted. He wanted Jesus to take up the throne but he didn't want it through the pathway of suffering. But that's because Peter never understood what real countercultural servanthood or countercultural servant mindset looked like. So then what is taking root in Peter's heart in this moment is you cannot wash my feet. Now think about that they arrive here and walking. If you had open, you know, if you wore sandals everywhere all the time and your feet what would begin to happen to them on a dusty Palestinian road over and over and over. The cuts, right? The smell, the odor, the dirtiness. Even if your whole body had already been bathed and washed, once you got somewhere before preparing yourself, especially for a Passover meal, there'd be the washing of the feet. Well, here, one of the most humble things that a person could ever do, God in the flesh kneels, before Peter, and Peter says, you'll never wash my feet. Can you imagine Jesus kneeling at your feet, offering to wash your feet? Do you know that survey after survey, when you ask people what feature of their body they like the least, do you know the number one ranking in surveys? Feet, feet. People told my wife for years, they say, you have Donna, you have the most beautiful feet. And she does, but I'm like, they're still feet. They're not beautiful, <laughs> right? And she's not listening to this, I pray. Forgive me, right? It's like, they're not, they're just, they're, they're feet. What is it about feet? And I'll tell you, after a whole summer, I'm on study break. I'm like, I, I'm like no shave Tommy and flip-flop Tommy. My, my staff and my family know. It's like, I don't want to shave and, and I wear flip-flops. And by the end of summer, my feet are very, very different after where they're dried out. They have different cut. They have just different things because all summer long, I, I, I wear flip-flops when I'm on my study break. Now, what happens when the God of the universe, the creator of the cosmos, kneels before you to wash your feet and you refuse. 
Well, I guess maybe it's the same way when you say, hey, you don't, know to, you don't need to get on that cross. What was Jesus' response? His response was, get behind me, Satan. You shall not be sifted in this moment because Peter was offering the same thing to Jesus that Satan had already offered in the great temptation in the wilderness. If you just bow down to me, I'll give you everything that your eye surveys the devil, Satan told uh, Jesus. Satan was offering Jesus a kingdom and a crown without a cross. Peter just can't imagine. He's looking for a political revolutionary. He's looking for a Messiah who does not kneel before him and do what even a Jewish slave should not do. So Jesus' response, one of the most magnificent responses of ferocious love in all of the Bible. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Verse eight, Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. You get none of me then. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. I mean, wash me from head to toe, to wash my soul, wash me, my mind, my heart, my all. And Jesus answered, Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet for their whole body is clean and you are clean. You are clean, though not every one of you. Verse 11, for he knew who was going to betray him and that was why he said not every one was clean. He knew that Judas was gonna do exactly what he was gonna do on that night and betray the Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane. The rest he knew at the arrest, he knew that he was going to leave that meal early and depart to go and do exactly what it was that Satan had sifted him in that moment to do. But when you look at this, I want you to know that I don't think that the NIV does as good of a job rendering the Greek, and there are some textual variants where a particular phrase has been left out, but it just, to me, it just doesn't make sense. So I go with what is the most traditional way of looking at verse 10, and that is that Jesus says, those who have had a bath don't need to be washed again except their feet. Those who've had a bath don't need to be washed again. ESV, English Standard Version, gives a better rendering, I think, of this particular verse. Accept their feet. Why is that? Because you've already washed your whole body and you've come into the meal and it's only your feet that are dirty. But what's Jesus saying spiritually? Jesus is saying, you can have whatever you think's been washed. You can do whatever you think to be clean. But unless I wash all of you, which is why Peter had that response, unless you are washed by me. And what is happening is the foot washing is already showing the condescension of God. Theologians, the doctrine of the condescension of God is that God, how is it possible that love came down? How is it that God becomes flesh and tabernacles among Amongst his people. It is the most beautiful act of love and humiliation. What is that? That he should humble himself and become a man and certainly to die and suffer on a cross for us. And the foot washing is pointing to the cross. The foot washing then is already pointing us to the work that is to come, that we have a God who loves us so much that he kneels before us. Kings don't kneel before their subjects. Subjects kneel before their kings. Jesus is a countercultural servant. He's kneeling at the feet of Peter, and Peter's like, You can't wash me. You can't. Can you imagine how nerve wracking this would be? I can tell you right now, if immediately right now we had as part of the application that those of you that came together here to church that are in family units or friends or roommates, if we started having ushers walk down the aisles here at, at, at this church and handing out basins of water, and we said, one of you just wash the other, but the other doesn't get what? You just, not, not right now, just one of you. Some of you would get very, very nervous. Some of you would begin to just be like, well, I'm not, you'd already make your decision. You know, some of you, you're a first time guest, you're like, please tell me you're not about to do that, Right? <laughs> Have you ever even had someone else wash your feet?
the God who literally formed and fashioned the cellular structure, who coded the human genome in the apostle Peter, is kneeling at his feet and washing and scrubbing through the smell and the odor and the dust and the cuts and the calluses and the roughness. And Peter is telling him, no, 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 no. And Jesus says, you need me to wash every bit of you, Peter. What has he done in chapter 12? Predicted his death. What is he doing now? He's setting up the tone for what's about to come. This is the night he will be arrested. And the next day on Friday, he will be crucified. Verse 12, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and he returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord and rightly so, for that is what I am. So you're calling me rabbi and your Lord. And they knew that that's who he was. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, Peter had already declared. Now that I, your Lord and teacher have, look at this, washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Do you know that in this same chapter, John chapter 13, he says, a new command I give you to love one another just as I have loved you. That's in the same chapter. That's part of the discourse and the explanation that night. Just, I give you this new command, love one another just as I have loved you. This teaching happens after the foot washing according to John. Do you think that Jesus means that real love of one another is that we would what? Wash one another's feet the same way. Just as I have loved you, love one another. Just as I have washed your feet, wash one another. How can we not see the connection and the depth of his teaching and his discourse if we read the entire chapter? So Jesus says, if I've washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. Some of you are like, well, oh, I've seen my spouse's feet. Ooh, you know, ah. I've set you an example, Jesus said, that you should do as I have done for you. This is not just a polite suggestion, is it, by Jesus? And don't, don't misunderstand me. You can literally wash somebody's feet and not be a countercultural servant. You can do it begrudgingly. How many of us do things in service even for ourselves. We don't do it out of love, we do it out of hunger. I need to be loved by you a particular way, so I do something, it's a utilitarian, it's Aristotelian, it's Aristotle's utilitarian friendship, right? I'm only doing it because I get something in return. This isn't love. This isn't deep abiding service. It's when you, you see that something's different and you see the example of Christ and God kneels before his subjects, the king kneels before the subjects and washes their feet. The creator washing creation's feet. Ooh. Very truly, I tell you, verse 16, no servant is greater than his master. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Who is greater? We well, say, why is that even important? Because, and this is, this is really important, Eastview family, because Luke's gospel says in the context of the Last Supper, this, this Lord's Supper, Last Supper, Passover meal, the disciples, some of the disciples right before this were arguing with one another about who gets pole position in the kingdom of heaven. Who's greatest? Am I gonna get to sit at his right hand? Do I get pole position? They were arguing about who was the greatest. So now, if we take Luke's gospel, we pull it in together with John's gospel, and we begin to see that Jesus is instructing here, no servant is greater. He's correcting the very argument that he already knew that they were saying. No one's greater than their master, right? Well, right. Am I your Lord and rabbi, or aren't I? Yes, did I not just wash your feet? Then why wouldn't you wash one another's feet? Why are you sitting here arguing about pole position in the kingdom of heaven? So then what? Now that you know these things, verse 17, you'll be blessed if you do them, if you're a countercultural servant and actually do them. I have come again from Texas. I, I, I guess speaker, I've come here enough. I don't even feel like a guest speaker. I feel like Eastview family. Is that okay? You know what I'm saying? Outserve one another, don't outrank one another. 
When I read John 13, I see Jesus just saying, a new command I give you, love one another just as I've loved you. Therefore, wash one another's feet just as I washed your feet. So, so what are you really saying, Jesus? Outserve one another. Don't outrank one another. Spend your life out serving. The world operates on personal advancement through position and power. The world has always operated this way, is I'm gonna personally advance and it happens through position and power because we do not transfer power well in life, in family, in corporations, because we don't see power and leadership is really only the gift of stewardship. That's it. We don't own it. We just steward leadership. We just steward power for a season and we are supposed to use it for the glory of God and for the benefit of others. And if we don't use it that way, right, then people feel frustrated. But sometimes power dynamics can be very, very interesting. Sometimes those who feel like they've been subverted then insert their power to complain about the power dynamics of someone else rather than washing their feet. This is the heart of love that isn't masquerading really as just hunger. I'm hungry for your love, so I do something for you instead of, I just love you anyway. This is the love that kneels. This is the counter-cultural revolutionary love of our Savior Jesus Christ and the foot washing. So outserve one another. Don't outrank them. Followers of Christ are not to seek worldly advancement of position and power. We should be like Jesus. Jesus operates on kingdom advancement through service and sacrifice. That's how, it's about community. It's about others. It's about what the heavenly Father's doing through the advancing of the kingdom, and it comes through service and sacrifice. So the call from Jesus here is to outserve one another. Don't outrank one another. Outserve one another. Don't outrank one another. I remember when God really laid this heavy on my heart. In 1999, my wife Donna and I moved from Dallas, Texas to Atlanta, Georgia. We were, I was the senior pastor of a church. I was 31 years old. I was a senior pastor of a, of a growing church. God was blessing us incredibly in the suburbs of Dallas, but we felt a real calling to go and plant a church, like a parachute plant. We moved, we had a church, massive church uh, sponsored support from another church, so generous, supported us financially. But we moved to the northern suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia to plant a church, what now, is, it used to be Alpharetta, Georgia. It's now the west side. It's called Milton, uh, Georgia. And when we went there in 1999, uh, our youngest kid, Cole, was not even born yet. We only had Grant and Rebecca that, ha that had been born. And when we planted Stone Creek Church, I remember the intimidation that I felt. I was like, my goodness, what do you do? How do you even start church? First day I'm going off, I get up the first day after we'd moved there and the movers had unpacked all of our boxes. My wife goes, what are you doing? I go, I'm going to work. She goes, where? You don't even have a church. You don't even have a business card. You don't even have a phone line. You know, we stepped out on faith and I said, well, I'm gonna go, I don't know, I'm gonna just go to Best Buy and shop. She goes, for what? I said, not really shop. I'm gonna pretend shop, try to meet people, strike up conversations and hope they'll ask me what I do for a living. And of course, whenever someone asked me what I did for a living and I started meeting people, say, I'm a pastor. They'd say, really, where? And I said, well, <laughs> the church doesn't exist yet. To which they were probably like, oh, that's cool. I'm the CEO of a major airline. Oh, which airlines? <laughs> well, it doesn't exist yet. I mean, it's like, what do you say to somebody like that? So it's like, I'm gonna plant this church and, and, and it was just me and Donna and our two kids. It took... It took three months before we had seven adults. Three months, and I left a church that had several thousand and was exploding, and my friends in high school, people from college were joining the church in the suburb of Dallas. I was 31 years old, we moved to this, and I'm like, I was, I, we started the church, and I was like, oh my God, what, so what size is your church? Two. I was like, Grant was three years old. Rebecca was um, like 18, 19 months old. I'm like, you two hurry up and pray to receive Christ so we can double the size of this church, right? We need to get you saved and baptized. What do you do? Well, I tell you what, the church, God blessed it and it grew and it grew and grew. Five years later on Easter, we had 3,000 people in attendance in that church on Easter weekend. By the grace of God, hang on, listen, listen. Here's the thing. 
God moved in such a way, but I was so worn out and involved and invested in pouring myself into this church. So one day, a bunch of, that I, I didn't know what I was doing. I was learning. I was green. So one day, a bunch of pastors that had planted churches kind of in the southeast region of the United States decide we're going to get together. And this guy's dad owned a condominium or a couple of condos down, I think it was Destin, Florida. So we go to the beach. We're going to do these round tables. Everyone is told, every senior pastor, these guys gather, gathered around from that southeast part of the United States said, hey, you can bring one associate with you. Bring your executive pastor or bring an associate pastor with you. Well, my two guys that were, that were really kind of right and left hand, they couldn't go. So I went by myself. I drove that six hours, went down there. We start the session. We start whiteboarding all the conversation pieces so that we can learn from each other because we've all started and planted, church, started churches and planted them, right? And um, after like three dozen topics are on the board, we decided we were gonna start with what we thought was most important was what has God taught you in this season? What is the one thing that you would say right now, God is drilling down on you and teaching you in this season in your life? I thought, that's a great place for us to start. People are going around the room and it gets to this guy named Chad. And Chad says, oh, that's easy. God is teaching me how selfish I am. And I'm like, oh. He says, in fact, God has showed me that through the difficulties of starting and planning a church, even as the associate pastor to his senior pastor was sitting next to him, he said, I have learned that I am so self-absorbed and so selfish that God has said, this is the year of only one thing. He's given me one word. And he said, outserve. Specifically, outserve your wife. And I'm sitting there and the conviction just overwhelms me. Just like, I'm like, oh, who invited this guy? <laughs> He's not even a senior pastor. <laughs> All these years later, I don't remember one bit of wisdom or nugget about any strategic implementation of the next strategic initiative on how to get your church, blah, 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 blah. The whole way home, I was in my pickup truck for six hours going through small towns from Destin, Florida to Atlanta. Tears were streaming down my face. I just knew that God sent me there because my wife had outserved me the whole time planting Stone Creek Church. And I had not been serving her the way she had been serving me. So I just, I was like, I'm going to shut up and put up. I'm not going to say a word. So every day for about a month, I pulled my truck into the driveway. Didn't matter what had gone on. Didn't matter what had happened. I was like, just get in there. Bathe the kids. Unload the dishwasher. Right? Load the dishwasher. Then unload it again. Whatever it takes. Just serve, 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 and don't say anything. About a month later, I... Uh, I didn't say anything to Donna. About a month later, I'm teaching a message and I shared that, at least this illustration. And uh, Donna was sitting there. And this is the first time she ever heard it. She's sitting in the audience listening. So when we get home, she's like, I wonder what had gotten into you. <laughs> I was like, well, can I? You know, she's, she's like, I wonder. It's like bringing flowers. She's like, what have you done, right? It's. I wondered what had gotten into you, and I told her what had happened, and she said, because she didn't want me to go. She had told me that, I don't want you to go. I need you here, and I, that's part of the conviction. She had asked me not to go on this trip, and I was like, I got to go anyway. I need to learn. Of course, after that, she said, you can go to the beach anytime with those boys, <laughs> was her response. What do you do to outserve one another? You don't outrank one another. Why? Because you got to lay down your ranking, lay down your interests, lay down your opinions. John 15, no greater love does someone have than this, that they are willing, Jesus said, to lay down their lives. You're like, you won't even lay down your ranking or your opinion. You, you won't even lay down your hurts, some of us, right? Me. All of us, I'm in it with you, man. I, the, trust me, there's no ivory tower preaching going on here. I'm a fellow struggler and sojourner, a fellow East Viewian in this. I don't even think that's a word, but it is now. What is Jesus doing? Countercultural servanthood. He's saying the way up is down. The way up is down. 
Jesus on his knees, but he was always countercultural this way. Matthew 20, 16, so the last will be first and the first will be last. He's saying the way to greatness is through service. The way to greatness, it's always been through service. Luke 22, verses 24 through 28, a dispute also rose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest, what I was talking about earlier, right here in Luke. Jesus said to them, the king of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors, but you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest. What? And the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater? The one who's at the table or the one who serves? And they were getting ready to eat a meal and there's Jesus serving at the highest position of honor, kneeling before their feet. But I, Jesus said, I am one among you as the one who serves. The way to power is always to serve. And the way to glory is through suffering. Really? This is the whole point of the foot washing. It's already pointing to the cross, the cross work that is to come, the moment of that great night, the chapter before that was just being taught, even this last week. John chapter 12, verse 23, Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. How is it glory that you're going to suffer? Jesus said so. Verses 27 and 28, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, I don't want to be saved from the cross. For this very reason, I came to this hour. For this very reason, I kneel to wash your feet so that I can go to the cross. Or none of you will be washed. In fact, the foot washing is a precursor to the blood washing the blood of Christ that washes over us, that makes us whole, that makes us complete. Father, glorify your name then. A voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it. One of three occasions where the Father's voice speaks loudly in the scriptures. But this is even for us, 2 Corinthians 4, 17, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Our afflictions are achieving Glory, your difficulties and pain that you go through, we still, even through that, wash feet. Now, think about this. Who was washing the feet? What was he facing? And whose feet was he washing? Because Judas Iscariot also got his feet washed. You don't have to like someone or love someone or see that they're faithful and loyal Every person, Eastview, that you lay eyes upon is someone for whom Christ Jesus died. 1 John 2, 2, he not only died for our sins, but for the sins of the world. God is kneeling, offering to wash our feet. He's facing his impending death. He knows he's going to be crucified the next day, and he stops. In the midst of the anguish, to serve, to love like that. I want to be a part of a church like that. Don't you? I want to be a part of a family like that. I, I want to be a part of a marriage like that. Then I better get busy washing everybody's feet and not expect mine to be washed. You have an opportunity for true power true significance to flow through you to others by the grace of God, Holy Spirit power, how? By washing feet, by saying, we outserve one another, we don't outrank one another, therefore I will outserve you, I will not outrank you. But you know how we have to get there? I wanna share a last verse with you in closing. I want you to see Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. How does that verse not visually, right? John 13 connected to the cross, the foot washing connected to the cross. You know how, you know how we ever get to where we are? Truly how we're gonna get to where we are? We're only gonna get there one way, Eastview family. We are only gonna get there 
if you and I will kneel before the cross. You can never have your feet, your heads, your hand, and your soul washed by a kneeling king of kings unless you will kneel before the king. If we kneel before the cross, Jesus kneeling before us will wash all of you, every bit of you. And then a new command I give you, love one another just as I've loved you, John 13, but wash one another's feet just as I have washed your feet. Seems like both commands are one and the same to the glory of God. Let's stand together as we sing this beautiful song, Oh, come to the altar where the Father's arms are open wide, where the Son of God is kneeling, desiring to wash, and yet there broken on the cross with no regrets, with no shame. We can come to the altar. We can come to the cross, but we must not bow up to the cross. We must bow before it to the King of kings and the Lord of lords and say, teach me. Teach me to be a foot washer. Teach me to serve and to love as ferociously as you do unto your glory. Let's sing to the Lord. Amen.